outdoorsmen are seeing abominations stalking our forests. Creatures like the black furred Gloacus that terrorized a Connecticut town, the spike tailed hodag, the rock hurling agropelter, and the sinister hide behind. Are these just tall tales spun over campfires? or do unknown horrors lurk in the woods? In today's episode, we're going to explore what primordial terrors could dwell in the hollow trees and darkened thickets. Have loggers and outdoorsmen truly witnessed the unknown lurking in the woods? Are these legends or warnings? I mean, after all, not all fearsome critters are fantasy. There may be a deadly truth lurking right behind you. You won't want to miss this episode. In the early months of 1939, a hideous beast terrorized the north central Connecticut town of Glastonbury. Well, kind of. While the stories apparently began as fact, the tale soon grew and grew. And soon it was a larger than life mixture of actual experiences and tall tales. For weeks leading up to the new year, people had indeed been experiencing things that were just out of the ordinary. The cold winter nights filled with the cries of animalistic shrieks, wails that almost sounded half human. Farmers surveying their snowy fields spotted trackways of immense prints like those of a house cat, yet far too large to belong to any domesticated animal. Perhaps worst of all, pets and livestock began to disappear. Some were found mutilated, their blood turning the snow shades of crimson against the stark white backdrop of midwinter. A handful of people even claimed to catch a glimpse of the beast, always moving on four legs, always darker than midnight, skulking like either a dog or an immense feline. I mean, some said that its eyes glowed like a pair of embers fading in a fireplace. Those who were especially superstitious claimed that it was an unholy mixture of canine and cat with the body of the former, but the face of the latter. There were only three things that everyone could mutually agree on. That whatever it was, it moved with an almost supernatural grace, that it was covered in coal black fur, and that it didn't seem to belong to Connecticut. Now, after these stories circulated for a few weeks in Hartford County, game warden Charles All's house organized a hunting posse to try and capture or kill this mysterious beast. Although he had no idea what it was, he recognized that it could pose a threat to the surrounding community, if not the people themselves. Then at the very least, pets and livestock might be in danger. The hunting party set out into the cold New England winter on January 14th, 1939. The search found nothing, of course, but, but that didn't keep participants from speculating on the nature of their quarry. Some thought it was just a bunch of hogwash. Others theorized that perhaps it was a mountain lion, perhaps a specimen that was said to have escaped from the zoo in Manchester, Vermont, the prior September. Now, this was the conclusion game warden All's house landed on. He had told reporters, because the animal is out of its native habitat, the animal is probably restless and might move on and be reported some distance away in a short time. However, it will probably stay around as long as there are enough rabbits to meet the needs of a mountain lion's appetite. Others thought it was a large bobcat or similar predator. In an article published later that month, a policeman from New Britain said this. Four years ago, there were two lynx off here in the Pinnacle Mountains. They were mates and nobody caught or killed them. They can have a whole family around these parts by now. But those who had seen the intruder knew that they were dealing with something out of the ordinary. Only one hunter ever saw the creature at this time, and his name was William F. Bonvalor of Hartford. William claimed to be out near Diamond Lake when he spotted a beautiful black creature about three feet long with a tail two feet long leaping out of the scrubwood. 
William was armed with his trusty double-barreled shotgun and opened fire with the right side. He aimed wide, however, and missed the 12-gauge splintering a rotten tree stump near the mystery animal's position. The explosion sent the black cat darting off through the underbrush. A second shot, also missing, throwing up a wall of snow as the predator vanished within a line of cedar trees. Now, just because everyone came up empty-handed didn't mean that the hunting party was a failure. Now, to the contrary, the local newspaper, the Hartford Courant, had struck gold. It jumped on the opportunity to indulge in such a sensational story. The newspaper article ran the day after the hunting posse was formed, and it treated the topic somewhat seriously, if a bit tongue-in-cheek. I mean, at first, the Courant called the beast the Glastonbury, what is it? But that apparently didn't move enough copies. The creature needed a catchier name. So editor Francis King found success only three days later with a headline on January 18th, 1939 that read this, Guffaws of Glastonbury, Gloicus greet gloomy gang of gunners. Okay, hold on here. I thought this story took place in Connecticut, not Sesame Street, or Dr. Seuss for that matter. Okay, hold on here. I, I know what you're asking. You're wondering, what the heck is a Gloicus? Well, According to the Courant, who named the beast, the name comes from Glastonbury, its habitat and form wacky, to describe the way everyone feels about the whole thing, the ending makes it sound Latin and authentic. The newspapers ran with the story, whipping the area into a gloicus fueled frenzy. Maps were published alongside the articles, showing the locations of both sightings and where the hunting parties had searched. Other points of interest included where mutilated animals had been discovered, where howls were heard, and even where dogs had chased something. At the peak of the Glaucus fever, it was estimated that 200 hunters were roaming the area around town with the express purpose of bagging the beast. Now, for a time, the Glaucus served as Glastonbury's unofficial mascot, lending its name to community dances and supporting events. Children even built Gloicus's Gloicai in the snow. Hunting clubs fashioned targets in the creature's alleged shape so the hunters could practice before their shot at fame passed them by. The Gloicus became something of a punchline with advertisements and newspaper offering to make Gloicus scarves for anyone who brought in the authentic pelts. Now, the entire thing reached peak absurdity in April of 1939 when local spelunkers Roger Johnson and Clay Perry claimed to have driven the animal from its lair in Ankrum, New York's Indian Oven Cave. Now, they swore that they cornered the Gloicus in another location, Bashful Lady Cave, where they took two shots at it, fatally wounding the predator. And for a moment, everybody was excited by their description of the beast. Roger and Clay said that the animal resembled a cross between a bear and a lynx, but sported a small pair of tusks. Strangest of all, the Gloicus bore a small suction cup on each paw, which enabled it to traverse the cave floor, walls, and ceiling with amazing swiftness. Is it just me, or did Stan Lee actually draw some inspiration from the Glocus for Spider-Man? Now, as proof, they offered up photos, but it doesn't take a biologist to recognize them as fakes, unfortunately. Roger and Clay made their Glocus out of a lady's fur muffler. Do you ever read these stories about old hoaxes and just wonder where people find the time to do all this nonsense? Yeah, me too. Underneath all this absurdity, however, an undercurrent of fear began creeping into the town of Glastonbury and the surrounding community. Calls flooded to the local law enforcement office at the slightest hint of anything strange children became scared, parents double-checked the locks on their doors each night, now, it might seem silly given how the media had treated the subject, but at the heart of the sensational Gloicus story, something genuine was happening. People were still seeing something that 
in the words of one witness, looked like a dog yet resembled a cat somewhat. Others spoke of dogs that have chased the animal into the woods and have been clawed. Some did not return. Now, in one instance, the animal was spotted by a church deacon. One of the most important developments occurred on February 24th, 1939. Resident Harold Roberts discovered a trackway four miles east of town. Since they resembled the massively oversized prints of a house cat, well, the tracks were assumed to belong to the Gloicus, and the trail continued for two miles before it was lost. Now, suffice to say, tall tales do not leave behind footprints. Hoaxers do, yes, but traveling two miles through the snow in the dead of winter with fake lion feet strapped to your boots in an isolated area four miles outside of town does not seem like a wise use of anyone's time. It seems like something happened in Glastonbury, Connecticut in 1939. Something authentic seems to have taken place underneath all the cheeky articles and practical jokes. So what happened to the Gloicus? Well, for the most part, sightings simply became less and less frequent. Some people considered the mystery solved when in early July of 1939, a large brown dog was killed by hunters. It had taken the bait from a bear trap, became trapped in the process, and was shot before being buried in an unmarked grave at an undisclosed location. Now, if neither a dog-cat hybrid nor a feral dog, then what was the Gloicus? Some researchers have speculated that it was an animal known as a fisher or fisher cat. Now, these carnivorous mammals, which are closely related to weasels and badgers, do indeed live in New England, but are shy enough that locals in Glastonbury might have been unfamiliar with them. However, this is a giant assumption as the possibility that anyone would have mistaken a four foot long weasel, the absolute largest that fishers can grow for a gigantic feline predator. In the years since 1939, Gloicus sightings have happened on and off all throughout Connecticut. A brief rash of sightings would flare up in the 1950s, complete with reports of a large black animal. Now, the sightings came to a head in the summer of 1959 near Granby. Another cluster of accounts would pop up again in 1967. Today, however, people rarely bother with the old-fashioned name Gloicus. They simply say that they saw a Black Panther, which is strange enough in its own right in North America. Now, when people talk about the Gloicus nowadays, they are rarely referring to the actual sightings that would unfold around Glastonbury. Now, more often than not, they discuss the Glocus as it is and how it has been mythologized. A half-cat, half-dog creature, perhaps with a little bit of bear thrown in for good measure. Nowadays, the Glocus cackles like a hyena and is attributed magical powers. It is blind, but navigates using its nose and its ears. And if you stare into its empty eyes, you will find that you soon will forget all about it as the Gloicus has the power to erase your memory. In short, the Gloicus has become what cryptozoologists call a fearsome critter. Now, you might know these as lumberjack legends because over the centuries, loggers throughout America especially in the Great Lakes region, developed their own brand of storytelling. Alongside such myths as Paul Bunyan and his blue ox babe, lumberjacks told stories of animals said to haunt the forests of North America. Now, although most of these animals are regarded as hoaxes and tall tales, could any of them have a basis in reality, like the Gloicus might? Some clearly do not. Some of the most absurd, fearsome critters are, well, downright laughable. Consider the squonk, a gigantic pig-like creature said to be so upset over the way it looks that it never stops crying until at last it dissolves into a puddle of its own tears. Hey, you know, I dated a squonk once. Or the fur-bearing trout, a fish that grows a fuzzy coat to keep itself warm in colder climates. Furry and smelling like fish? Yeah, I dated her too. Now, obviously, a majority of these animals are made up, but every now and then, if only rarely, these tongue-in-cheek stories present aspects that have a kernel of truth. 
Consider the hoop snake, a serpent which, when confronted by danger, bites its own tail to escape and just nopes right out of there, rolling away like a wheel. Now, for years, this was deemed impossible until August of 2019, when naturalists researching dwarf reed snakes in northwest Malaysia witnessed this exact same behavior for the first time ever. As the scientists approached the dark and slender reptile, a nocturnal creature that hides beneath rocks and logs during the day, curled into an upright hoop, cartwheeling downhill to safety. Stunned, the team captured the snake and placed it on a flat area along the side of the road. It cartwheeled again several times, this time with no help from gravity. The researchers even captured this behavior on video. No other snake has ever been witnessed performing this maneuver. Now, Malaysia is obviously quite some distance away from North America. There's no way that lumberjacks ever saw a dwarf reed snake, but it still shows that this behavior is possible and that it is enough to make us reevaluate a lot of these rural legends. Now, another fearsome critter once believed to be nothing more than fantasy is the jackalope. A staple of Wild West iconography, the jackalope supposedly resembled a regular jackrabbit, but has a prominent set of antlers or horns growing out from between its ears. I mean, nowadays, you can easily buy fake jackalope heads online from creative taxidermists. We realize how silly this is today, but early settlers might have been accurately reporting something that they had actually seen. In fact, some biologists have suggested that the jackalope legend was an attempt to describe rabbits afflicted with the Shope papillomavirus. This disease causes tumors to grow over a rabbit's body, often protruding at odd angles. And when appearing at the head, these tumors could easily be mistaken for horns. Granted, some fearsome critters are easier to believe in than others. But like the Gloicus, some descriptions sound awfully familiar to anyone interested in cryptozoology. Now, for example, some people are quick to label Bigfoot as a fearsome critter. This position seems more than a little disingenuous, given these centuries of eyewitness sightings and then you have indigenous lore collected over the years. So to say nothing of the ample physical evidence in the form of alleged footprints, hair, and even droppings. Another fearsome critter that might be describing Bigfoot is the hide behind. Now, in lumberjack legends, the hide behind is a creature that conceals itself behind tree trunks. And if you're last in line on your logging crew and look behind you, you might catch a glimpse of the beast. Well, if you're lucky, you might just spot it ducking out of sight. And if you're unlucky, well, it takes you out to dinner and it ain't kissing you first. Now, for this reason, the hide behind was often blamed whenever lumberjacks went missing in the woods. Now, as it turns out, the rough and tumble loggers had a guaranteed way to avoid being taken. It seems as if the hide behind hates alcohol, a great excuse for anyone wanting to get drunk and stay drunk. So next time someone says you're drinking too much, just tell them you're getting hide behind proof. Well, at first, this sounds like just another spooky tall tale. I mean, some cryptozoologists and researchers had begun to suspect that this was yet another way for frontiersmen to describe Bigfoot. What's more, the legend may not originate with European settlers, but actually have roots in indigenous belief. Now, among those taking up this position is podcaster and author Timothy Renner. In his 2018 book, appropriately titled, Don't Look Behind You, Renner wrote this. I found reference in Pennsylvania folklore to a warning the First Nations people of Pennsylvania gave to the Europeans when they first arrived in these lands. The newcomers were told to beware of something called the hide behind. This creature was known to follow travelers through Penn's woods, peeking from behind the trees and snatching unsuspecting victims. It was said that when traveling through the forest, only the bravest should be the last in line, for it was only the bravest who could be relied upon to never look behind. From its behavior, the hide behind would seem to be another name for Bigfoot creatures. Bigfoot witnesses have reported seeing the creatures peeking from behind trees. Bigfoot are often said to pace witnesses or to follow them through the woods. 
If they are not the same thing, the hide behind and Bigfoot seem to share a lot of common ground most notably the woods of Pennsylvania. Renner's work also intersects with another fearsome critter called the Agropelter. Lumberjacks claim that this beast dwells within hollow trees and conifer forest stretching from Oregon all the way to Maine. One source described the beast as having a slender body, the villainous face of an ape, and arms like muscular whiplashes, which it can snap off dead branches and hurl them through the air like shells from a six inch gun. From its perch high among the branches, the ape-like agropelter would wait for its victims to pass underneath and then hurl debris at them, most often branches. This way they could harm innocent people without risking their own safety. You know, just like people commenting on YouTube videos. As with the hide behind, the agropelter seems to represent another way for lumberjacks and other woodsmen to explain deaths and disappearances on the job. Anyone who died when a branch fell on them wasn't a victim of bad luck. They were targeted by the agropelter. The description of this particular critter certainly brings to mind a primate. And while this could easily be another way of describing Bigfoot, it seems that the agropelter was a little on the small side to be a squatch. Now, as it turns out, cryptozoologists collect an entire subset of reports dedicated to what some call Littlefoot. Now, Littlefoot resembles a small Bigfoot. Some speculate that it might constitute a juvenile Sasquatch or even a shorter subspecies. However, the agropelter's affinity for throwing things most strongly resembles a creature from Timothy Renner's neck of the woods. Folklore from around Columbia, Pennsylvania speaks of the albatwitch, a creature that resembles a miniature human only entirely covered in hair from head to foot, Alba twitches are said to stand no taller than four feet and are most frequently encountered around a local landmark known as Chickie's Rock, a rocky outcrop that juts above the Susquehanna River in Lancaster County. Like the agropelter, the Alba Twitch is famous for tossing things at people, sometimes from the safety of the trees. Their favorite projectiles to throw are apples, either stolen from picnic baskets or plucked straight from the tree themselves. In fact, some people believe that the name Alba Twitch is a corruption of the phrase apple snitch. And if you ask people in Rhinelander, Wisconsin about our next and final fearsome critter, they'll most likely chuckle and tell you it's all a bunch of baloney and buy you another beer. I said another beer because look, you're in Wisconsin. But for a handful of people, the hodag is no laughing matter. It all begins in 1893. Eugene Shepard, a lumberjack living in the area around Rhinelander, races into town to share the news. He claims to have just run across a fearsome beast and barely escaped with his life. The monster is beyond anyone's worst nightmare. It has a long row of jagged spikes running all the way down the length of its back. If that's not scary enough for you folks, that back ends in a tail tipped with spears sharp as needles. If that's not scary enough for you, let me tell you, if these gigantic claws, claws worse than a wolverine, if that's not scary enough for you, well, you should see the mouth on this thing. Teeth bigger and sharper than anything you've ever seen could disembowel a grizzly bear with one bite. I tell you what, my friends and neighbors, I'm lucky to be alive. Me and my buddies, we saw this thing and headed straight into the woods, cornered the beast, and blew it up with dynamite. We did. I call it the Great Black Hodag. As seen here in this black and white photograph, Eugene even offered proof in the form of a picture taken moments before the creature was slain, or it was a staged reproduction of the moment. It was never 100% clear. Now, real or not, Eugene claimed that the hodag was the last of its kind, a race of the fiercest, strangest, and most frightening monsters to ever set their sharp claws upon the earth. People in Rhinelander took Eugene's story with a grain of salt. He had a reputation for pulling pranks, wasn't exactly a trustworthy, genuine individual. Maybe he thought he was, but, well, you know how that goes. 
Now, according to one story shared locally, he once ran something of a scheme where he sold perfumed moss, of all things, to the post. Now, when an angry creditor showed up on his doorstep one day, Eugene had the perfect way to get out of it. He took a bar of soap, lathered it up, and wiped the suds over his lips, and then answered the door with a growl. The creditor was so frightened at the prospect of being bitten by a rabid Wisconsinite that he turned tail and ran. The odd thing about Eugene's hodag story is that he didn't abandon it right away. In fact, he kept up the charade for years to come, eventually going so far as to claim that he kept a captured specimen on his own property. So much for killing that last surviving hodag though, right? Now, according to Eugene, the acquisition of such a terrifying monster was quite the ordeal, requiring several bear wrestlers who used a chloroform-soaked rag to knock the creature unconscious. After that, he brought the ho-dog back to his home, where it lived in his barn. And Eugene would charge folks to visit, performing an elaborate act that involved getting dressed in nice clothes. After that, he'd step into the barn, closing the door tight, and spectators, having parted with their hard-earned cash, would hear snarls and screams from the inside, and the minutes would stretch on until at last Eugene stepped back out, his clothes torn to shreds. In reality, it was a second set. By some estimates, up to 5,000 people would visit the barn each weekend. That's a lot of money. The influx of cash made Eugene's act even more elaborate. At this point, it sounds like he was a very good showman. His sons began puppeteering a hodag model behind the scenes, which resembled a stumpy lizard with horns. Postcards with photographs of the fearsome hodag were printed up, circulating through the mail, and soon, Eugene took his act on the road. He was raking in the money with his hodag act at county fair after county fair. But unfortunately, the Smithsonian Institution took interest and dispatched an investigator to verify Eugene's claims that he had captured an undiscovered species. After resisting their initial request to examine the hodag, gee, who's surprised by that? He eventually buckled under the pressure. And years after his initial claims, Eugene Shepard admitted, shocker, that the hodag was a hoax, nothing more than a wooden sculpture animated by wires. Now, despite the way Eugene's story fizzled out, the hodag had already taken on a life of its own in Rhinelander. Now, despite the way that Eugene's story would just fizzle out, the hodag had already taken on a life of its own. Rhinelander embraced the fantastic beast as a town mascot, erecting a giant statue that you can visit today, naming the local high school team after the hodag and creating more hodag merchandise than you could or would ever want. The hodag also found a place among the fearsome critter stories that lumberjacks exchanged when traveling through Wisconsin's Northwoods. Those who hadn't heard that the whole thing was a hoax fashioned their own origin story for the hodag, claiming that it began its life as an ox. Now, for years, this ox helped loggers pull timber out of the woods until it died, only to be resurrected as the hodag. The creature then embarked on a campaign of destruction and killing the dogs and livestock of its former owners, sometimes even slaying the lumberjacks themselves. It was said that the hodag only ate white bulldogs on Sundays. But there's more. Just when it sounded like the hodag was an open shut case, an example of a tall tale that became a little too infamous for its own good, up stepped the eyewitnesses. People from throughout the northern area of Wisconsin came forward with their own stories, implying that while Eugene Shepard might have later hoaxed the hodag, his initial encounter, you know, where he killed one of them with dynamite, was apparently authentic. The witnesses knew this because they started claiming their own encounters with the creature. In fact, the most common story saw fishermen having their best fish stolen after the hodag snuck up on their boats. Golfers in and around Rhinelander claimed that the hodag grabbed their balls that 
came out wrong and stole their golf balls. Who can dispute such reliable sources as failed fishermen and bad golfers? Could the hodag have any basis in reality? Some people see parallels between the creature and Mishu Peshu, an Ojibwe spirit also known as a water panther. Now, petroglyphs of this deity can be found around the shoreline of Lake Superior. It's true that depictions of Mishi Peshu bear more than a passing resemblance to Eugene Shepard's creature, including four legs, a tail, a row of spines down its back, and a pair of horns on its head. But we have to ask ourselves, were these witnesses just pulling our leg? Are there any eyewitnesses alive today who claim to have seen a hodag? The answer is maybe. On the internet, it's difficult to tell whether a person is being earnest or not, but if we take these accounts at face value, it seems that some individuals have run across strange things in the Northwoods. One poster wrote on an outdoors forum, I've hunted ducks and deer in the Rhinelander area for many years, so I am very familiar with the hodag. I have heard mysterious crashing sounds through the brush and willows near the river before sunrise that must have been a hodag, but it was too dark to see. I have also seen deep gouges on trees that were probably caused by its spiked tail. A channel on YouTube called Rhinelander's Hodag also features a handful of alleged sightings. Now, at first glance, it looks like either a channel set up to lure tourists to Rhinelander or maybe a joke channel. But once you start watching the videos, it looks like it might just be run by a Hodag enthusiast. Man, that's got to be a small club. Now, for a while, it looks like whoever ran the channel collected every mention of the Hodag that they could find from news segments to commercials. There was even a monthly Hodag sighting report at one time or another, although whoever was filming these seemed to have given up a long time ago. I mean, hard to do a monthly Hodag report when people aren't seeing Hodags all that often. Now, the channel also links to a website now offline called HodagSightings.com. If you decide to check it out on Wayback Machine, be careful. After clicking on results from 2011, some of the names in the title bar read hentai online. Anyway, a few videos on the Rylander Hodog channel stand out as being possibly authentic. Emphasis on possibly. The first cheesy video features a Hodag researcher describing the encounter of a man named Pierre Treetop Williams and his fellow logger, Axe Handle McCoy. Now, apparently, Pierre and McCoy saw a Hodag in 1930 and 1932 in Rhinelander. The creature was standing 16 hands high and stretching four loggers in length. Now, this suggested that Eugene Shepard's Hodag was a juvenile. The researcher also claimed to be in possession of a 1765 statement from French pioneers who also saw a creature resembling the Hodag, as well as another sighting from 1726, claimed to be the earliest sighting we have on record. The video ends with a pitch for Rhinelander's Oktoberfest celebration where the researcher claims he will reveal all the details. Yeah, sure you will. The second video is much better. It's either authentic or the witness is a better actor. Take your pick. In this clip, he says this. I was mushroom hunting on a logging trail up in northern Oneida, a county north of Rhinelander. I got to a turn in the trail. As I made the turn, I saw this green thing. He was whistling and he was clapping and he was on three legs, pointing to something that was around the corner in the ditch. When I got there, sure enough, there was another one. And when I looked back at him, he took off down the trail. In the ditch, I heard grunting. It sounded like somebody who ate potatoes trying to get into an old pair of Levi's. But it wasn't. It was another hodag. I thought it was giving birth. You know, its head was leaning back, trying to get its horns near its tail. As I got closer, I realized he or she must have sat down in an ant's nest and it was all over the tail end of this hodag. I kind of felt sorry for it, and I got real close. There was nothing I could do. I had already wet my pants, and the first thing I saw was this huge green tail, and I thought it was a snake. Because I was used to snakes, I learned how to sleep standing up on a dresser when our boa constrictor got loose in the house. 
I figured best I could do was maybe take the bottle of mosquito lotion in my pocket, take out the cork, and splash that on the tail of this hodag in a ditch. Maybe that would get rid of the ants. Big mistake. I tossed the mosquito lotion, the ants kind of scattered, this thing popped up, screeched, and all the seed cones fell out of the trees. Anyhow, I thought it was coming after me, but it wasn't. It was looking for help. I kept dodging behind trees, trying to get away, and when I finally got to a point where I was exhausted and it was exhausted, it after another big scream, backed up to a huge pine tree and started scratching from the back end to the forward. Now, fortunately, I was near my car. I was at the end of the trail. I went to my car, waited for a bit when everything seemed to stop. I walked back to get my mushrooms, which were in the bag. I looked and that tree was leaning about 30 degrees. All that was left at the base of the tree was a head and the horns of that hodag. I took it back home and I have it mounted over a fireplace at one of my cabins. Last time I told that story was to a door-to-door -door insurance salesman. He didn't believe me either, so I'm going for 50-50 here. Okay, so if you're like me, that story made absolutely no sense. So maybe the YouTube channel putting up Hodag sightings was a bad choice for this episode. Let's go out on a high note, shall we? Something a little more credible. Now let's see. Uh, got a story here from Reddit. That okay? Anything is more believable than that garbage. Okay. Hey, Peter, cue the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, the good spooky music. Thanks, buddy. Now let's get serious. I got kids to feed. Six years ago, a poster on Reddit by the name of Make Mind Free to Go shared an odd experience from the late spring or early summer of 86. Let's call him Mark because there's no way I'm repeating that screen name over and over again. He was around 11 years old and was staying with his grandmother in Mequin, Wisconsin, far from Rhinelander, but in the same state where the Hodag is said to dwell. Now, whenever he would visit his grandmother, Mark would spend a lot of his time with his friend, Joe, and his youngest brother, Mike. They would explore the woods around the property, which included some train tracks and two small bridges, one for the railroad, the other for a bike path that stretched over a stream brimming with crayfish and minnows, a young boy's paradise. Now, one overcast day, Mark, Mike, and Joe found themselves by the creek in the middle of the afternoon. Mark and Joe were dangling their feet from the bridge, probably tossing rocks into the stream down below, when Mike shouted from the opposite side. You guys, he exclaimed, get over here real quick. You got to see this. There's something on the path. Now, half thinking that his younger brother was playing a trick on them, Mark convinced Joe to follow him a little way down the bike path to where his brother was calling from behind some foliage. The boys rounded a bend and finally saw what Mike was shouting about. Mark whispered, Whoa, what the hell is that? And Mark would write this. We stood there in momentary silent observation of the creature who was doing exactly the same thing to us. The thing just sat in the middle of the path, staring and watching. The creature sat on its haunches, posing much like a cat does when sitting, but appearing in that position to be about three feet tall. It was jet black in color, being covered in sleek fur. The eyes were the same, but glistened in the daylight, making it obvious it was watching us. The ears were very rabbit-like, very erect, almost if you could imagine how Bugs Bunny's ears are depicted. From its bottom, there patiently switched back and forth a tail, also very much like a cat. The creature gave the impression of being intelligent, curious, and alert. Pondering its image now reminds me a bit of Frank, the demonic rabbit from Donnie Darko. Never in my life had I ever seen anything like this then or since. Foolishly, Mark told his friend and his brother that he was going to try to get a little closer to the monster. He crept nearer. The entire time, the beast remained motionless, except for its tail, which constantly flicked to and fro. And initially, Mark and the creature were about 150 feet apart and he managed to close that distance to around a hundred feet before the creature darted off into the woods as fast as lightning. All three boys ran home to tell the adults who had just sat down to an early dinner. None of them believed the kids, of course. The only person who remotely entertained the possibility that they were telling the truth was a neighbor. When they shared their story with him a few days later, he jokingly suggested that maybe, just maybe, 
they had run across the fearsome hodag of the Northwoods visiting southern Wisconsin for its summer vacation. Look, I realize that some of you might be a little upset about this video. I know you come here for real scary stories, but sometimes it's fun to not take ourselves so seriously. I mean, after all, that's what the lumberjack tales of fearsome critters are. Fun stories to share with your friends and coworkers around the campfire. Just because most of them aren't true doesn't mean that they aren't fun. And it doesn't mean that real supernatural things don't exist because they do. I mean, just look at the Glowicus, the story we talked about at the beginning. Something strange was going on in Connecticut in 1939, and it all got a little silly. Now, there are a lot of stories like the Fearsome Critter Tales, and they deserve attention just as much as all the scary stories, you know, about dog bed and aliens and Bigfoot. And behind most myths and legends lies a glimmer of truth, if you know how to look for it, of course, and if you don't take yourself too seriously. And if you guys made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, Glowicus, 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 because I said that word probably 30, 40, 50 times in this episode. And I wanna see who actually made it to the end. And if you guys enjoy this kind of content, be sure to go ahead and slap that like and subscribe button for more videos like this one. And as always, don't forget, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.